The Clash of Kings begins with Arya losing her hair and venturing into a wasteland towards the end of the earth. A traveler and her party dies of mysterious causes, and they eventually find an abandoned village where they rest. This beginning strongly parallels Daenerys' beginning, who also loses her hair, also ventures into a wasteland towards the end of the earth, and also has a companion die of mysterious causes. And Daenerys also finds an abandoned village where she rests. And to a lesser degree, it parallels Jon, who also ventures into a wasteland and finds an abandoned village. Jon doesn't lose his hair or a companion, though. I bring up these parallels because Arya, Daenerys, and Jon all venture into their wasteland with cages. Daenerys' group brings three dragons, and Jon's group brings ravens, of which three can speak the name Snow. Dragons, of course, are related to Daenerys' eventual special ability of dragon riding, and ravens are related to Jon's eventual special ability of skin changing. Which brings us to Arya. She brings with her a cage of men, Jockin, Rorg, and Biter. And Jockin is a faceless man, which again is related to Arya's eventual special ability of face changing. But with three dragons and three talking ravens, I have to ask, were there actually three faceless men in that cage? Are Rorg and Biter faceless men as well? Well, let's go back and follow the adventures of Rorg and Biter. The story of Jock and Rorg and Biter begins in the Black Cells. We aren't sure how long they've been there. All we know is the jailer, Renifer Longwaters, thinks they're a dangerous lot and claims he didn't want them released. However, proper paperwork was in order and the three are given to Yorin. Yorin also believes they're dangerous and refuses to release them from chains until they get to the Wall. I'm not certain how men so dangerous and antisocial would ever be used at the Wall. Jockin claims he didn't choose his companions in the Black Cells, but the three were housed together for some reason, despite there being plenty of vacant cells. The unified housing points to a unified crime, but we don't have any idea what that crime might be. Jockin claims that he gave Biter his name, which is interesting, as Rorg continues to use the name Biter when Jockin is gone. This implies that Rorg met Biter later than Jockin did, or at the same time. After all, had Rorg and Biter known each other previously, Rorg would have had his own name for Biter. After their escape from the cage, Rorg and Biter choose to remain attached to Jockin. They join Sir Amory's men together, they ride together, they continue to eat together, and they know each other's locations. Rorg and Biter also seem subservient to Jockin. Within minutes of Jockin agreeing to free the Northerners from the Harrenhal cells, Rorg and Biter appear to assist Jockin. Now perhaps Rorg simply fears Jockin can hurt him, which is something Arya thinks about. But we should also keep in mind, it's Rorg who ends up wielding the axe when the three escape from their cage. So Rorg chose to free Jockin from his manacles. Rorg and Biter also share some similar faceless man qualities to Jockin. Rorg, like Jockin, is a spy who keeps a close watch on Arya. He remembers each of Arya's nicknames and later taunts her with them. Biter may also have the ability to transform his face. Brienne finds Biter's faces like putty, and his jaw can open impossibly wide. Biter also has on his face weeping sores, which is something the waif says she can give people. It's also something on the face of the plagued man at the House of Black and White. No other characters in her story are described as having weeping sores. That is, except for Ralph Kenning, who's on his deathbed. Jock and Rorg and Biter also have the incredible and unexplainable ability to fit in and perhaps influence people. Let's keep in mind that Rorg is a noseless brute of a man, 90% of what comes out of his mouth are threats to rape someone or something equally brutal. And Biter is a feral man with filed teeth who can't speak. Yet for some reason, after Amory Lorch slaughters Yorin's men, Lorch makes Jock and Rorg and Biter Lannister men and gives them horses and armor. Now yes, the trio likely killed Yorin, but it's still hard to believe that Sir Amory would employ such dangerous, unpredictable men. After the brave companions take Harrenhal from Sir Amory, Rorg and Biter are then assimilated into their sellsword company. Now this switch is a tad more believable, but still unlikely. Yes, the Brave Companions are a pretty brutal bunch, and Rorg and Biter did help out with the Weasel Soup incident. Still, Rorg seems like a liability for the Brave Companions. Vargo Hote actually has to assign a guard to prevent Rorg from raping Brienne, and when Brienne is being rescued from the bear pit, it appears Rorg even threatens Vargo. What's particularly odd about Rorg's professional career is that almost immediately after joining the Brave Companions, Rorg sits with the lieutenants. How on earth did he rise so fast? And after the Brave Companions abandon Harrenhal to the mountain, the company splits into three groups. One heads to Old Town, another to Maidenpool, and Rorg leads a third to Saltpans. So Rorg went on to achieve a leadership position. Somehow. 
Now, if Rorg and Biter were faceless men, it changes the narrative of Arya's three deaths a bit. When Arya tells Jockin her first name, Chiswick, Rorg is sitting right next to Jockin. Chiswick is later thrown from the battlements, a job that rings of Rorg. When Arya tells Jockin her second name in the bathhouse, Whis, a serving maid is with Jockin. This is a bit odd, as when Arya and Brienne both use the bathhouse, fierce old ladies run it. Whis is later brutally mauled, a job that rings of Biter. Now yes, Arya seems to think that a drugged dog killed Whis, but if Jockin used Basilisk's blood to drug a dog, where did he hide it when he was in the black cells? Did he have a vial of ass blood with his ass coin? If Rorg and Biter killed Chiswick and Whis, it may be that Rorg and Biter were paying their own debts, just as Jockin was. Another connection to the Faceless Men for Rorg and Biter is their obsession with Arya. Rorg and Biter were definitely trying to find her. You see, after Jaime and Brienne leave Harrenhal, the Brave Companions soon hear about the Mountain's coming arrival. They decide to abandon Vargo Hote and split into three groups. They are led by Urswick the Faithful, Timian, and Rorg. Tywin theorizes that the Brave Companions will head to ports to escape Westeros. Urswick's group heads to Old Town. However, Timian and Rorg's groups act a little odd. Rather than heading straight to a port, Rorg and Timian's groups head up to the Trident, where they come upon three members of the Brotherhood Without Banners. They kill and torture them and discover that the Hound is traveling with Arya. Now I will say, that is an awfully specific piece of information to get out of someone when torturing them. I'm not even sure the Brave Companions would know who Arya Stark is, and if they did, they would probably think she's up in Winterfell getting married to Ramsay. That's certainly what the Mountains men thought. The only person who would know that Arya is even in the area is Rorg, who may have pieced things together just as Jockin did. So after torturing the Brotherhood, Rorg and Timian's groups get on the Hound and Arya's trail and make it to the inn at the crossroads. There they torture the owner of the inn for information on where the Hound and Arya went. The owner likely did hear the Hound say that he was heading to salt pans to catch a ship. At this point, Timian's group splits with Rorg's group. Timian's group heads to Maidenpool, while Rorg and company head to salt pans. Rorg's company comes upon the Hound's helmet, and Rorg takes on the Hound's identity, a somewhat faceless man action. With the Hound presumed dead, they must think at this point that Arya is alone. Once in salt pans, Rorg's group burns every building in the area in a likely search for Arya. Keep in mind, burning a town down is specifically mentioned as a tactic to find people. We lose touch with Rorg's group until Brienne makes it to the inn at the crossroads. Rorg and company have tricked the Brotherhood without banners in heading north so that they can attack the inn. It's uncertain why Rorg and company want to attack the inn so badly. Perhaps they think Willow might be Arya, as Brienne did. Or perhaps they think Gendry might know where Arya is. Rorg and Biter are killed by Brienne and Gendry at the inn at the crossroads, and with them died many of their secrets. While we don't know if they were faceless men, their links to Jockin, their special abilities, and their obsession with Arya point to some sort of connection to the House of Black and White. In fact, they physically are Black and White. Of course, if Rorg and Biter were faceless men, this means that three faceless men were on a job. Their target must have been really important and really difficult to kill. Now, some of you may note that our author gave a background for Rorg and Biter to some fans during a 2006 book tour. Rorg ran a fighting pit and Biter was a fighter in it. And while that's interesting, it doesn't tell us anything about the Rorg and Biter in our story. Faceless men assume other people's identity, so who the original Rorg and Biter were is kind of irrelevant. Now, there is one more person in Arya's life who reminds us of a faceless man, and that's Sirio Farrell. Sirio, like the faceless men, is from Bravos, And like the Faceless Men, Sirio promotes quiet movement, blind training, and the observation of lies. However, in other ways, Sirio is the anti-Faceless Man. We first meet Sirio in the second Arya chapter of A Game of Thrones. We aren't sure who recommended Sirio to Ned, I'm guessing it was Van Poole, but Sirio had an excellent reputation. He's not a no one, in fact, he's somewhat famous. Sirio begins his lesson with Arya by telling her that all men are made of water, and when you pierce them, the water leaks out and they die. Now we aren't quite certain what religion Sirio is, but I would say there's a good chance he worships the Father of Waters, and not the Many-Faced God. Perhaps most significantly, Sirio tells Arya that she is never allowed to drop her sword, as it is part of her. The steel must be a part of your arm. Can you drop part of your arm? No. Nine years Sirio Farrell was first sword to the Sea Lord of Bravos. He knows these things. Listen to him, boy. I'm a girl. Boy, girl, you are a sword, that is all. 
This is, of course, the exact opposite of the House of Black and White, who encourages Arya to abandon her sword after they see her practicing with it. One night, the Waif happened to be passing and saw Arya at her sword play. The girl did not say a word, but the next day, the kindly man walked Arya back to her cell. You need to rid yourself of all of this. It's important to note that Syria was the first sword to the Sea Lord of Bravos for nine years, and let's remember that the House of Black and White is very interested in the coming election of the Sea Lord, and that Arya was smuggled into Bravos to avoid the Sea Lord's inspection. So the Faceless Men seem antagonistical to the current Sea Lord, and while we don't know if the current Sea Lord is Sirio's Sea Lord, I would say it's very, very likely that Sirio's Sea Lord was antagonistical to the Faceless Men as well. You see, Sirio tells a story on how he became the first sword to the Sea Lord. Now, Sirio's a good fighter, but he's not the best around. But that wasn't even part of the interview process. No, to become First Sword, Sirio was asked to examine a cat and tell what he saw. Others saw a fantastical beast, but Sirio saw a cat and says so. Now, at first glance, Sirio's tale is a retelling of The Emperor Has No Clothes. But that just doesn't seem likely. Of all the bravos that came to see the Sea Lord, no other applicant set a cat before Sirio? Really? No one? How is that possible? And why was the ability to call a cat a cat more important than sword skill when choosing a bodyguard? Well, let's remember that our story is a world of glamours, and Bravos is a city that contains a guild of glamoured assassins. It makes much more sense if this was a glamoured cat. And the kindly man tells us that glamours melt before keen eyes, and so if Sirio had keen eyes, the cat's glamour would melt away. It seems likely that Sirio got his job because he could see through glamours, Essentially, Sirio would be able to spot a faceless man, a fine skill, perhaps an essential skill, for protecting the Sea Lord of Bravos. So it seems likely that Sirio was a man whose job it was to spot faceless men, and therefore it seems unlikely that he would be a faceless man himself. Of course, it's possible that he's a faceless man pretending to be Sirio Pharrell, but we could also make that argument for anyone. From what we know about Sirio, the philosophy and politics just don't match up. But what are the politics of the faceless men? Well, we'll talk about the politics of Bravos in part three. Curious how Ice and Fire may end? You can check out George R. R. Martin's other writings at the Thousand Worlds Book Club.